Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome back to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is an engineer, entrepreneur, and an expert in e-commerce, Ramiro Velasco. Ramiro, thank you so much for joining us. Katie, thank you so much for having me. That, you know, makes me sound so smart. So smart. Your your professional <laughs> bio is amazing. So it's, let's dive right in and tell us a little bit about, give us like a 60 second overview of what it is do, you do now, and then tell our listeners a little bit about the backstory of how you got into this. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I like that structure. So right now, we're, we launched a business to get brands into Latin America via e-commerce. We basically realized, listen, we got all of this knowledge on how to sell online. And we've got all of these barriers on selling online in Latin America. And we sort of just looked at it and looked at what we were doing before and went, this makes a little bit more sense. So we started doing that. And there was huge hubris in doing it, by the way, because e-commerce experts, selling experts, marketing experts, none of that takes logistics. None of that takes importing. None of that takes like any of these other things. But we said, I'm sure we'll figure it out. You know what happened? a year of just running on a treadmill, figuring it out. And then we went, all right, now it works. There's a lot of people, a lot bolder people than myself will sell a service and then figure out how to do it. I I couldn't do it. I was like, listen, we got to get every single thing in line. So that was about a year, but hey, we, it, it worked. And now we, we have uh, brands selling in Mexico and having a great time. So that's what we do now. How did I get here makes no sense. Like zero. Everything I I like saying that everything I've done in my life has just happened to me. And I don't say it like, I don't mean like, I like it. Like, hey, I love that things happen to me. But it's just, there's people with more conscious decision-making going, what do I want out of life? How do I get there? For me, I've always been, and it's the ADHD. It's the digital age. It's the growing up online 24-7. The approach was a lot more, what do I need to do right now? And what car are we chasing? I'm just, that that's line. I'm just dogging, what are we chasing? So I do high school, by the way, but by the time I get to high school, I've lived in, in seven countries and I'm in high school and it just went, I have to go to uni. And back then I had a very toxic idea of what being clever was. So I was like, like what do smart people do? Engineering, let's do engineering. I'm not an engineer by any stretch of the imagination. So I go in, I, I do mechanical engineering, hate my way through the whole way, which I think a lot of people live that I don't like my degree, but I'm in for a penny, in for a pound, like now I have to stay. I People that drop out, respect them so much. People that want to go, hey, this isn't for me. I'm going to bounce, respect them so much. For me, I was like, let's finish it. So I finished that, moved to Indonesia for a year. I'm like a writer while I'm there for just doing fun, like side missions. One conscious decision I did make was I want to be back in Mexico. So by this point, I've lived abroad my entire life. And I'm like, I want to be back in Mexico. I come back and I start applying for jobs. Close my eyes, build a nice CV, close my eyes and start sending it out. And I landed an Amazon agency. I, which by the way, fun stuff, I almost didn't show up for the job interview because they said, hey, we'd like to interview. And I went, awesome, great, I'll come in. And then I went to the website and I was like, the listing's not up anymore. I have no idea who I'm talking to or what I'm going to apply for. I don't want to go and make a fool of myself. But I have a huge belief that you just have to get used to being rejected and it's exposure therapy. So I was like, listen, I'm going to go and they're going to make fun of me and then it won't be as bad next time. So I showed up and great, great conversation. They're like, yeah, you're hired. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how this happened. And I built my- <laughs> Did you say e-commerce. hired for what? Yeah, I literally, literally the, my first day I show up, because I, I show up and they're like, so what were you? Like, what's your role? And I went, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> but this this whole like ADHD and this whole like experience 
has made me very good at flying by the seat of my pants. That's something that I know I'm very good at. Like when it gets scrappy, when it gets improvisy, like that's where I shine. So I'm like, what's up? Let's do it. What are we doing? I can do it. Work there for four years. And then being in Mexico, working with all these brands that I can't get access to. It's like, oh, sales are up in the US. Cool, cool. And then they would go, my clients would go, let me send you a sample. And I'd go, you can't. Because <laughs> cross-border shipping's a nightmare. And that's where it clicked. Where it's like, cross-border shipping's a nightmare. There's all these products that we can't get in country. Right? There's, And I have all this knowledge on how to launch and operate and make this happen. If I can figure out how to import the products, then I can build the pipeline to open up our product selection to our consumers in Mexico. As a consumer myself, like I can open up how many products I can buy by just building this bridge. And that's what we figured. We built the bridge now. And now we are we have brands in selling in Mexico that couldn't do it previously. And it just feels like it's a good sort of like cap and cap to this part, you know, of like, I love that experience. And okay, now we're selling. All right, what's the next step? We'll figure out the next step. But it's a good time. What would you say as you felt your way along this process and built this bridge from scratch and figured it all out? You mentioned maybe even before we were on the podcast that you felt like you were running on the treadmill for a year, just not working hard, not Mm -hmm. making progress. What are some of the mistakes you would say you made along the way that you wish you could go back and, and tell your former self to avoid or maybe not to avoid? Maybe they were learning experiences. I think don't overthink things is the number one thing. I tend to be very, I once said I'm a perfectionist and then someone said, name one perfect thing you've done. And I went, oh no, (laughs) right? Like, but this idea, like legal, like the legal aspect was hugely, like was a huge issue for us, right? Like figuring out what that agreement has to be like for cross country, for cross border trade and ownership of product. And it's very easy at a small scale to go, yeah, we'll figure it out. But it's no, because we're building something. We're laying the groundwork for something that can build, grow long-term. So it's mentality, right? It's, is this complicated? Yes, it's a little bit too difficult. It's a little bit cumbersome to, to have to figure this stuff out. But I'd rather figure it out before I have clients than after I have clients, right? So legal was a huge part of it. Logistics was a huge part of it. But again, like it's something that had to happen. I had to find the right person to go, don't worry, I got it. And I think that's like the number one thing I've learned over the past year and a half now that we've been doing this. There's a lot of times you'll meet partners that tell you, hey, I can do it. But when the when my working style and your working style don't meet, we're going to break it off eventually. Right. It's like a relationship. Like if from date one, I'm already like I already don't like some of the things you do, then it's probably headed the wrong way. So right. that's been huge for me. Like meeting the right people. And I'm just like, hey, trust this partner. They'll deal with it. And if they can't deal with it, they'll let us know. Yeah. You know? And that's, I think, the the biggest learning experience. No, you can't be, you can't work with everyone. Right. Yeah. And that is a yeah. hard lesson to learn. I'm a people person. I like people. I trust people straight out of the gate. So that's something that I think I struggle with. And I think a lot of our listeners can relate to that as well. We want to believe somebody when they show up and they're like, oh, just trust me, I've got it. And that the people person in me wants to believe it. The type A control personality wants to just do everything myself. And neither of those are good. Neither of those are good things. I either run myself into the ground trying to do it myself or I put too much trust in in someone else. So I like that you've had to feel your way through that and, and figure things out. And for our listeners as well, once you were able to build a trustworthy team and figure out how to read people and what you're looking for, having that team makes all the difference in the world. Just trust is what you said. And that is really what it all comes down to for sure. Yeah. So I love that. I love I, that. So go ahead. I was going to say, I just had to restructure a bunch of things. Cause I was like, Hey guys, like I love what we're doing, except I'm micromanaging everyone. And that's so bad. I'm like, I got it. You got to have space. Whenever you're building a team, you have to have space to fail. Yeah. I have to feel like, Hey, I can mess up. And you have my back instead of, I can't like my boss won't let me mess up. So I had this conversation literally 10 days ago where I was like, guys, I messed up. I've micromanaged all of you. And now you all depend on me for things that you shouldn't depend on me for moving forward. 
It's your responsibility. And if you mess it up, you messed it up and we'll figure it out. Like, I got to trust that. And I let that go. And I've been so much happier. Yes. I bet you've been happier and, and your team probably has been as well, right? Sure. Um, on, the, on the one hand, there there's a little extra pressure because now the pressure's on them. But on the other hand, if you're always being micromanaged, you can't really excel at anything either. I feel like Stan's a very naturally good person at that. I'm like, he's very good at setting the standards and then not micromanaging, but knowing when to step in. That's not my, yeah. that's not my gifting. That's not my gifting at all. So certainly something that I struggle with to kind of shift gears. And I love this, what we've been talking about. Tell us a little bit about, so your, so go events developed a seamless process that takes care of everything from like logistics. And then you guys run ads and things as well. Tell us a little bit about what the process of, if a company reaches out to you to want to work with you, what does, where do they get started? What does that process yeah. look like? How does that work? So let me go a little bit into why, because we had to create it this way. My face should not be this close to the camera, by the way. <laughs> Basically, well, so we have pretty strong like thesis or hypothesis from where we're, from where we're starting. Uh, right? We realize that most brands don't not enter Mexico because they don't want to sell in Mexico, but rather because it's a headache and there's a lot. There's a lot of cost involved, and not only money but also inventory, but also opportunity costs and like the attention that it's going to take and all these things for a market that I don't know if it's going to be good or not. I don't know if it's going to, my product's going to sell. I don't know if it's a market fit and like people need it or whatever. So we realized we, whatever that barrier is, we have to be lowering it. So one is cost. Sure. The other one is, you don't, you should, if you have to get your own marketing team here, that's already more work. You have to get your own design team down here. That's already more work. If you have to run your own ads down here, it's already more work. So we figured partly we're selling ourselves, but there's no real competition. Like it's not a model that exists. A big part of it is we have to sell the Mexican e-commerce market. And to really make that appealing, I have to lower those barriers to entry. Because I, you know what, I'll pay you set up fees. I'll pay you monthly retainers, whatever. I don't want to have to hire a whole team for this. And that's where we went. All right. If we really want to address the pain points, we have to do it top to bottom. Right. On the other hand, we already had all the e-commerce expertise and the agency is still very strong and we get to run stuff through the agency, which makes it easier for us and simpler for us. But we're very much committed to not, hey, trust us. But hey, trust the Mexican market. Let's see if we can make it work without that much headache for you. So we figured Texas is the easiest place to cross a uh, product. There's Tijuana with uh, San Diego, but Laredo, Nuevo Laredo is a really good point of entry. And we found the perfect partner to that has that sort of uh, know-how. And that solved everything. Because now it's like your commitment to this expansion or the, your time commitment to this expansion is just getting a, a shipment sent to Laredo, Texas. And we then figure it out, cross it over the border, bring it into Mexico City, make it go live on all the platforms, handle the distribution, handle fulfillment, inventory management, advertising, and all of this. Um, but it's almost like we had to figure out every step along the way. Because otherwise... Listen, I would love to expand to Mexico, but you want 10 hours of work from me a week? Are you crazy? We can't even make do with what we have. It was very often what we were hearing. So, Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I love that. I've asked, stolen all the questions so far. Stan, what do you have for Ramiro? Yeah, I want to step back. I've got a couple lines of questioning that really I'm, I'm excited to explore with you, and they're related. The The first one is, like, uh, I'd like to have a like a conceptual conversation with you about how you approach the branding process, I mean, irrespective of culture. What's the thought process that goes into thinking about how you build a brand around something? Do you, do you have a way that you do that? Yes. And I love that question. And I love conceptual. As soon as you said, let's get conceptual, I was like, oh, this is my jam. Like, <laughs> So actually that's changed over the years a lot in my understanding of brand building and on e-commerce platforms specifically. 
I think brands in general have a certain way or look or feel about them depending on industry. We see time and time again, like an industry giant changes their brand and you go, their branding and you go, that doesn't feel right. Like I, I, I was looking at, I don't know, like maybe six, eight years ago, a wholesome giant, cement giant, concrete giant made they had this red and black logo and it said wholesome on it and i was like all right that works like that's just what they are and i guess that's why we knew it and then overnight they are now blues and greens and they're saying we're eco-friendly and i was like i don't want to buy concrete from someone that's doing this and that really stuck to me i was at an airport and i was very familiar with it because i was my father worked at that company for a long time and i remember just looking at it going that doesn't that's not the right branding it just doesn't feel right so i think on one hand industry level Absolutely. But on the other hand, I think that's really interesting is where are you selling? Not, not only what are you selling, but where are you selling? I think if you have a brand brand, and I make this distinction, a brand brand, then presentation is, has to be impeccable. Your copywriting has to be acceptable. Your uh, taglines, the design. For e-commerce brands specifically, data shows that good branding is not good conversion rate drivers. It's not a good conversion rate driver. Like really fancy design on Amazon, really fancy design on any really e-commerce platform. You go in, it doesn't sell you. Because in so, to some level, e-commerce brands have become commoditized. And we're going in and we're going, tell me what I need to know. We're going, all right, like I'm buying a mug, right? Tell me dimensions, tell me if it's durable, and tell me how long it will take to get here. I don't care how nice your design is. So the top sellers on Amazon, what we consistently see, is really not that nice design. Like bold and like letters all over the place. And it's because you're shouting the information at me, right? So we then had to take all these approaches and go, all right, when we're generating content for social media, make it nice. Make it pretty. Get the clicks. We're generating content for Amazon. Make it not ugly, but make it to the point. Make it a little bit tacky, a little bit tasteless. Because with the bold letters and me telling you exactly what you're looking to buy, I'm going to convert better and get better ranking. Mm. So it's understanding the intent of your consumer and when you're hitting it, what like what point along the, the way you're hitting them, like, very, very, very top five. I've never even heard of this product. You see videos of someone like just recording themselves on their phone. And then look what I found on Amazon. That's the very first sort of spark where you go, oh, my peer said this is nice. Okay, let me look into it. So building a brand is all about, to me, figuring out where you're hitting these people more than the traditional well, brand building principles. Okay, great. That's useful. That's insightful. So let me drill into that a bit further and ask the follow-on question, which is how has that process impacted in a cross-cultural context? Really fun points of info. We can think of Mexican e-commerce being like uh, American e-commerce for about eight years ago. Eight years ago, we're talking 2016, there's trust already, but it's not the biggest volume driver. A lot of uh, companies are looking at their e-commerce like an offshoot, right? It's, yeah, sure, I guess we just do whatever you want, put it up. I don't want to think about it. And that also comes with a lot of really interesting things, like a lot of consumer trust. Right now, in America, if you're going into Amazon, you'll have a slight distrust of products. Like, who's selling it? Why is this brand 17 consonants string together? I don't know if I trust this specific product in Mexico, we're not there yet. So in Mexico, we get to, let's say, be a little bit more conversion driven. When I tell you this is a really nice mug, you'll trust me that it's a really nice mug. So that on the other hand, language is hugely important. I have to understand what I'm buying, especially for things like supplements, things like anything that goes in my body or on, on my body. Like I, I got to understand it. So language and a lot of wording on the trust of the seller because there's still that little bit of a distrust of going, does it get to your house? What happens if I don't get it? Will I get reimbursed? So across the board, we've put up 
on our listings off Amazon, because on Amazon, we can't control that. We can't control who has to buy box. But on, on all the other platforms, we're going GoAvant, sold by GoAvant. We are exclusive distributors, work directly with brands. This is not a knockoff. I have an image like that, conversion rate went through the roof. And we ran into that a little bit because we, because we're not a reseller, we came in with a lot of products and we dropped the price by 40, 50% because we're working directly with the brands and people went, Hey, is this an original, whatever it is that you're selling? So we just went, this is a constant question. Yes. Hey guys, everything we work with is original conversion right through the roof. So yeah, just understanding your market is, is fun. It's so fun. I live every morning. I'm looking at the financial markets every morning. I'm looking at newsletters with fun inf well, information about the world. Instead of picking up a newspaper, I'll read morning brew and whatever. And it helps you just understand people. It's nice. What are your favorite platforms? For selling or for yeah. Amazon and Mercado Libre in Mexico are absolutely massive. I'm really fond of Liverpool. Uh, not a huge volume driver, honestly. But it's, there's a little bit of, not a lot of people there. So we like being some of the bigger sellers there, even though, again, it doesn't do that much volume. But we're hoping that by making enough volume, they'll knock on our door and go, hey, can we just buy your products? So Liverpool is like a slightly fancier Sears here in Mexico. Is like, your focus primarily on product sales as opposed to service sales? So our model incentivizes us to be into product sales. We considered having like a management fee, a monthly retainer. We've A-B tested it and seen like how we feel about it. I'm a very big fan of incentives being aligned. My sort of thesis for existing in the business world at all is no one really wants to work. And it's no one's fault. Like I think no one should want to work. So how do I make the systems incentivize work? How do I make it in your best interest to do what's in my best interest? And how do I align my best interest with yours, right? And this is how I manage teams and this is how I manage. So our business model is literally like, if I can't get your product selling, then I, we're not making any money. Yeah, no, product, no. I, so. I hear that, but I guess I was asking a different question. Oh yeah, so okay. In, in the work that you do for the, you know, the clients that you have, is that work done primarily for like a, like tangible products yeah. Or, it, or is it like financial services or other kinds of services? Is what's what do you, what are you mostly into? We're mostly into products. And I think that was a big uh, this is actually a really interesting point that you're bringing up because when working as an agency you're a service. Right. And when working as a distributor your service is secondary. It's your product. How are you selling it? There's some service aspects. So we serve products, but our focus has shifted from our service to our product in this. So really interesting distinction. Yeah, but the people that engage you are selling a products. tangible thing, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Okay, 100%. so what are some examples of some of the products that are your staple client relationships? So I'm really fond. I don't know how much I can just open up about it, but I'm really fond of a lot of our supplements clients. Mm. It just so happens that sellers in the supplement space seem to be like a good vibe. I'm not sure why. Um, so those monthly calls are always really nice. A lot of coffee products I'm really fond of. It's mm. a, a, They're a really passionate bunch. And because I'm a huge coffee head, like getting on those calls, I mean, like, hey, I tried that recipe. You told me like I put 15 grams instead of 12 and you it's nice. So I think those are some of my favorite client relationships. As far as specific products, I'm not sure if yeah, no, anyone's really... I'm not asking you to reveal yeah. any comps. I'm, yeah, so um, I, just, I thought there, there might be some brands out there that where everybody knows you're doing the work for this. Mm -hmm. and this. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean... It just, it feels weird to name drop. I like, I don't like plugging my business on. I don't no, like I'm, name drop. I'm, I'm, I'm withdrawing the question. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. It's all good. <laughs> it's, yeah. We appreciate that Stan and I have a law firm here in, in Little Rock in Arkansas, and we appreciate you um, not asking us the name of some of our clients. So that's great. So <laughs> we'll, we'll just put that, we'll take that away in the same boat. Yeah. It's always <laughs> weird because, because we'll, we'll, I'll get the question of, Hey, can you send me some references? And I go, yes. Cause I have two or three that are like, yeah, sure. Send over like our case studies or whatever. But can I talk to someone? I'm like, I don't want to bother my existing clients by having you call them. Like it, it feels a yeah. little bit, so I never know how to answer a lot of these questions. 
Yes. No, we, Stan and I can definitely relate to that. We oh, feel yeah. bad even asking for a good Google review. It's a process we're working through. So we get it. We understand. We understand. I think, yes. go ahead. We, I think we might all have the same thing of being overly polite as well. Yes, for sure. <laughs> That's, I can definitely see that would be. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so funny. My partners are New Yorkers. They're a little bit more myself. Yes. Our other, Stan and I have another partner in the business and he's a New Yorker as well. So he doesn't mind doing all of the things Stan and I hate to do. So it's just, it's part personality and part where you're raised, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. They'll straight up go, well, so tell them what, who cares? And I'm like, what do you mean? Who cares? If I got this email, I'd be like personally offended. Yeah. Who cares? I care. I care. I care. If care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we can relate to that for sure. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you would like our listeners to know before we have to sign off? Let's hang out. Anyone that wants to chat to me it doesn't have to be work related. I realized recently that I was just scrolling through LinkedIn. I hate the LinkedIn vibe. I'll be honest. The whole I'm here to promote and sell and think you're doing wrong. I don't like any of that. But when I get a message, it's, hey, man, what's your thoughts on this? I'm like, oh, yeah, I can really dig into this. Let's. So if anyone wants to connect, hang out, you know. My time should be valuable. I don't respect it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's perfect. So uh, for everybody listening, this has been the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. And our guest today was Ramiro Velasco. And to connect with Ramiro, you can find him on LinkedIn. We will link the company and his personal LinkedIn site as well. So be sure if you are interested in knowing more or if you just want to hang out and chat with him, I assure you it's a great time. Be sure you connect with him on LinkedIn. And thank you again so much for listening to the show. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.